everybody. I mean, he's happy to be in the house of God tonight. Amen. Why don't we clap our hands to Jesus one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, clap your hands on you people and shout unto God with a voice to try. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Along with Pastor Creasy, thank God for what we are feeling here in this service tonight. Amen. I'd like to, I'd like to feel the fire of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I uh, thank God for it. Praise God. I want to fulfill whatever purpose God has for us in this house tonight. I want to fulfill that and uh, be the best ambassador of God that I can. Praise God. Praise God. Again, I do want to say sincerely thank you for this again for allowing us to be here with you this weekend. And uh, as he said, our, my parents have known the Christians for some time. I suppose I have to. I just uh, didn't know that I knew you as good as I did. It's so, so beautiful to be with you this weekend and fellowship today. Thank you so much. Praise God. Let me appreciate your pastor and his wife. Amen. They are so vital, always have been. And even more so in the day and hour we're living in. Um, I say this a lot, and I'll say this here, but if this is your local church, and um, you call Reverend Sister Priest and your pastor and pastor, Bill, there should not be a day that goes by that you don't call their name in prayer and ask God to strengthen them, and guide them, and lead them. You owe it to them and to yourself because it does, it's reciprocal. Blesses the woman, then it comes back to you and blesses you too. Amen. So we honor them. We honor them today. All music, singing has been awesome. Praise God. If you have your Bible, I'd like to turn your attention to the book of Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 20. Matthew 18 and verse number 20. Matthew 18 and 20, the Bible said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Have you ever read that scripture before? I know you have. It's really a staple. Scripture. So we're going to talk about it for a few minutes here. Amen. We'd like to talk to you for this subject, Jesus in the midst. Jesus in the midst. And I pray that you would help us. Let's go to God one more time and ask him to continue to have his way in this service. Jesus, once again, we humbly approach you and come to you, God, reverently. We ask for your help, your divine assistance, the anointing of God to break and destroy every yoke, and also give us understanding of your word. God, you said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Give us an ear to hear the word of God. For your words are spirit, and they are life. Let the words I say, God, let them not be my own, but let them be from heaven. Let them be yours. In Jesus' name, we pray, and we thank you for it. Have your way in this place continually, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Thank 
reluctantly, I say, because I figure it's true for at least most of us, that everybody here, if you don't currently have them, you probably will at some point, and, or you have in the past dealt with issues issues. You know anybody, anybody know anybody that's got issues? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You ever said that to somebody when they got issues? Yeah. They got issues. Uh, yeah. Truth is, we all have our own issues. At least we've had them, or if you've done a little living, yeah. you've had to deal with issues. Yeah. Uh, it's a running joke with my wife and I. We see people that we label them. They got issues. Sometimes we tell ourselves, I think we're the only people we know that are normal people. Everybody else has got issues, but we're the only normal people. Um, there was a lady in the, in the Bible that had, the Bible describes her of having an issue of blood. And although ours may not be the same issues as hers, uh, we all do have to deal with our own issues. One thing I've learned about God is that our personal or family issues have never stopped God from working on our behalf. As a matter of fact, I think it's accurate in saying that not only is he not pushed away by our issues, but I would say on the contrary, he is drawn to us because of our issues, because he desires to help us with them and through them. How many could agree with that? Um, I've seen things before. And I've thought to myself, and perhaps you can identify with this, and there's a statement that goes along with this that describes it well. If I see something that I just don't want nothing to do with, and don't want to be involved in, I might say something like, man, I wouldn't touch that <laughs> with a 10-foot pole. That's right. I've heard that before. Some things may extend the pole a little bit, a hundred foot pole. <laughs> and what we mean when we say that is that is something that is above my pay grade. It's, it's something that would be overwhelming to me if I got in the middle of that. It's something that if I put myself in the middle of that, I, I, would, be, uh, I would be just so in over my head because I don't have the answers to what those things require me to have. So I just, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot. But if I could just speak on his behalf here, I don't think Jesus has ever looked at a situation and said, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot. There is no situation that he has ever seen that he thought that's above my pay grade. Right. That's, that's beyond me. Right. Amen. If, if I could just take my time a little bit here tonight, years ago. Well, if I could go back further than that, I've always enjoyed and, and I like old cars. I like old classic cars. It's just, I like it. I, uh, I like going to car events and things like that. Uh, I've always wanted an old car, but I didn't have the money to buy one because they're not cheap. And I've, I'm more uh, drawn to what they call the muscle car. The 60 mid, late 60s. I like it. 
the louder, the better. The more exhaust you can smell, the better it is. And, and being more specific, I'm, a, I'm an old Mustang. Oh man, if I ever find one in my in my Ross Lane, I'm gonna get it. So I'd look every now and then, not serious. And one day a, a buddy of mine sent me a, a picture of one that was for sale. He said, You ought to check this out. I went and looked at it. And forgive me for being personal. This is not my notes, but I do it just for a I, I went and looked at it and 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 I bought it. And it was I just thought I can't pass this up. It was a 1965 Mustang Fastback. Two plus two. Original engine with original four barrel. Nothing had been changed. It was the it was the man and woman's first car in the car. So I bought it. It was cheap. The reason it was in my price was that had been sitting in a field for 35 years. And it was <laughs> shit. That's why I was in my project. But I thought, this this car, it, somebody needs this car. You don't need to sit in this field. Somebody. I bought it. Uh, my brother and I went and got it and pulled it up on the trailer, or let me retract that. The wheels were turned, they were the hug the life, and we drug it. And got it home, and I was so proud, I, and I just, I could see it. I could see it shining, wheel, new wheels, and sparkling, but it was far from that. And so we got it home, and, and man, I, I initially was so excited about it, and I woke up the next morning, went out, and it was still on the trailer. Went out and looked at it. Man, reality started setting in. <laughs> and I... I, I walk around that car and I say, what in the world? How about I got myself into it? I opened the hood and closed it back and something would fall out. And I thought that was probably important. I don't know what that was, but that was probably something. And, and I, I, I never got the trunk open and I finally got a crowbar and pried the trunk open and got it open. I was anxious to see what was in it and I finally looked in the trunk and there was no trunk. It was gone. It was rusted out. It wasn't. And rat's nest were all in the... I, I, I brought a lot of rats home in that car. I could hear them running around in that car. And every time I would open the door or open the trunk close it, something was falling out. I've got to, i got to get out of this situation. So I took a picture of it. I mean, just sitting on the trail. I never took it off. I advertised it. And I, I just said, Lord, if you'll get me out of this mess, I'll, I'll praise you from now to eternity. Advertised it. And this guy called up. He said, hey, you got that old Mustang? I said, yeah, man, I got it. He said, well, I want it. I said, well, you probably ought to come look at this thing. He said, no. He said, I'll take it. I said, are you, you, you sure about that? He said, yeah. And I'm like, solid. And he says, matter of fact, he said, is it still on that trailer that's on the picture? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, if it's on that trailer, he said, just bring it to me. And I'll pay you to bring it to me. I thought, man, this is a good thing. So I took it to him and pulled up at his residence and he walked out. Didn't even hardly look at it. He just said, well, come on in and we'll set it up. And I said, I stopped him. I said, you know, I said, you really, you need to look at this car. I said, you need to open the hood and close it. <laughs> at least once. You need to look in the trunk. You need to, you need to inspect this. And he said, he said, I'm good. I said, no, I said, you really need to Look at this vehicle. I mean, it was, when I say rusted, it was, I mean, it was rusted. Every part on there needed to be fixed. He finally saw that I was struggling with this. And he said, well, he said, let me help you. He said, 
I don't have to look at it close. He said, number one, he said, I can see from here. The important stuff is there. I said, all right, well, that sounds good. I said, but I, I really think you ought to at least take a closer look. He said, let me help you. And this was worth the whole deal to me. He said, I know where you are. He said, you got involved in this. And he said, you had grand ideas and great, and man, he would read my book. He said, you, you, wanted, you wanted this to be a, a, a beautiful vehicle and you was going to make it that. And he said, all of a sudden you realized you was in over your head. And I said, well, you, you got God. And he said, he said, the difference in you and me, because it was true, because I'm not a body man, I'm not a great mechanic, I'm not a welder, I'm, I'm none of that. He said, the difference in you and me, he said, this is the business I'm in. He said, this is what I do. He said, I don't even have to look close, because I don't care what's wrong with it. He said, it don't bother me, because I know I can fix it. I said, I said, Lord, that sounds a lot like you. Because there's a lot of stuff I said I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. It's got too much rust. It's got too much decay. It's got too much ruin. It's in over my head. It overwhelms me. I wouldn't touch it if you paid me to touch it. But every time the Lord sees situations like that, he said, that's the business I do. That's the stuff I work on right there. That's what I do. That, that is where I shine. Bring it to me. That man said, he said, I'm going to take this car. He said, when I'm done with it, he said, I'll make it better than new. He said, it will be better than new. Amen. And God is in that kind of business. Amen. <laughs> Things that we look at that overwhelms us and we say, how can I fix this? How can I put it together? How can I make it work? If you bring it to Jesus, Jesus will say, that's the business I'm in. I'm in the business of changing lives. I'm in the business of putting things back together. I'm in the business of restoration. I'm in the business of renewal. And it doesn't matter how bad it seems it is in your life tonight. If you bring it to the Lord, nothing in your life will overwhelm Jesus Christ. Nothing in your life is over his head. This is the business he's in. He's in the business of saving. He's in the business of healing. He's in the business of delivering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody said amen. amen. He's never looked at anything and said, I don't want to deal with that. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, on the contrary, he wants to be involved in every area of our life, regardless of how it's represented. The Bible said in the text that I read to you, the Bible said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name. Somebody say, in my name. In my name. He said, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus wants to be in our midst. The devil wants you to think somehow that our midst is a hindrance to God, but it's not. It doesn't drive God away. But regardless of what's represented there, he said, if you'll put my name there, he said, I will be there. Amen. Amen. There's, there's, there's no criteria of what else is there or what else isn't there that allows him to come. All the, all the qualifications are is if you establish my name there and you put my name there, he said, I will be in the midst where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so the reality is, you know, he said we're two or three are gathered together. I mean, it means it could go. It could go the less. It could go more. But he said that's not really, that's not really what I'm looking at. What I'm looking at is if you'll establish my name. It doesn't matter what else is in the midst. It doesn't matter what's not in the midst. 
He said, but if you put my name there, I will be in the midst. The devil wants you to highlight everything else that's represented in your midst. Well, look at this. This is going on. Look at this, and this is represented. And look at this. This is here. Jesus doesn't want to be in your midst, but I think he would want us to understand that he doesn't care what else is going on in our midst. If you call on my name, and if you establish my name there, he said, I will will be in your midst. The Bible said in Luke 24 that as it came to pass while they communed together in reason, these are two men that are on their way to Emmaus. They're on their way to Emmaus and everything in their life has been turned upside down and inside out. Their life that once was going in a certain direction now has been turned around. And it was filled with chaos and confusion and doubt and fear. Yes, and the Bible said as they communed together and reasoned, the scripture says Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But the Bible said that their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are saved? Jesus had been crucified. They believed in him. He said he was going to rise again, and he did. And they didn't know he had risen yet. They hadn't got the memo. They hadn't got the news that he was alive. So now they're leaving everything they believed in, and they're headed down to this little town called Emmaus, and the Bible lets us know here that, that their, their communications are one way, and Jesus said, and their, their walk was going the wrong way, and their emotions, were, everything they were doing was wrong. Their communications was wrong, and it was affecting their walk, and their walk was wrong because they was leaving Jerusalem, and they was heading to Emmaus, and then that affected their emotions, and the Bible said they were sad. Everything they were doing, everything in their midst that represented who they were was kind of going in the wrong direction. Their talk was wrong. Their walk was wrong. Their emotions, they were feeling wrong. It was all wrong. But the Bible said, but Jesus himself drew near. Amen. That gives me comfort that he just doesn't come to the midst of everybody that's got it together. And he doesn't just come to the midst of everybody that's always on top of the mountain and everybody that's talking just right and everybody that's just walking right. But even us every now and then that don't have the questions that life brings and life gets kind of tilted on its axis a little bit and we find ourselves turned upside down. I'm glad the Lord doesn't say, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that, but I'm glad Jesus says, I want to be in that midst. I want to join that midst. And the Bible said, Jesus himself drew near. I'm glad when I'm not on the top of my game, Jesus still wants to be in my midst and a part of I don't know what you are represented with here tonight, and I've come to destroy the lies of the devil. If the devil is trying to tell you Jesus don't want to be a part of your life, that he doesn't care about you, you got too much going on in your midst, I want to help you with the Holy Ghost tonight and let you know that God wants to be in your midst, and he desires to be in your midst. And if you call on his name, he said there, in the midst. Amen. Somebody said praise God. I like the words that the Bible uses here. But the Bible said that Jesus himself. He could have easily sent an angel. He could have easily sent a minister in spirit. But he said, you know, those people got some issues. And they got some problems, and it's causing their direction to get messed up. It's causing their communications and their talk. They ain't talking just right. Their emotions are upside down. This, this is a job for me. 
And the Bible said Jesus himself through me. When you don't have all the answers to life, Jesus says, that's a job for me. That's a job. When, when you got parts of your life that you think this is an issue and this is an issue, Jesus doesn't look at that and say, well, when you get it all together, I'll be there. And then in the meantime, I'll send an angel down to help you. But no, when we get to those places in life that we don't have all the answers and we don't have all the solutions and we're wondering which way to go and our emotions are upside down, Jesus says, you know, that's a job for me. I'm going to go yeah. myself. Yeah. Amen. That's what happened when Abraham was on, on the way up the mountain with his son Isaac and they they had they had bits and pieces of life but they didn't have all the answers and his son looked at looked at his father and said hey we got wood that's something we got and we got fire he said but we're missing a big part of life we have a big question here that we don't have an answer to he said where where is the sacrifice and Abraham looked back at his son and he said God will provide himself a lamb when you don't have all the answers to the questions of life and you're saying I need this that's a job for God himself to come and to work in our midst I believe there's angels in this house I believe, come out and help me now I believe there's ministering spirits in this house but greater than that I think Jesus is in our midst to heal and to deliver and to make hope place. He's here. He's here for you. Can we clap our hands again to the Lord? The Bible said he would provide himself a lamb. You know, God's got a history. Jesus has a history of coming himself. He don't just have a big history of saying, I'm not going to that. I'm not coming. Somebody else take my place there. He has set a precedent that he will come and work for us. Himself, Matthew 8 and 17, the Bible said himself took our infirmities. He didn't send anybody else. He said, that's a job I'll do myself. Galatians 1 and 3 lets us know who gave himself for our sins. Galatians 2 and 20 let us know I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 2 and 20 said that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it and there's coming another day in the future not too far that the Bible said for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven when it's an important job he's going to go himself he's going to work himself on our behalf when you need healing he's going to heal you himself when you need deliverance he's going to deliver you himself when you need direction he's going to calm himself Somebody shout, Jesus! For two or three. For two or three are gathered together. In my name. There I am in the midst of you. Somebody say, in the midst of you. I've been raised in church all my life. I've heard this, this verse talked about a lot. Yeah. And we use it, I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we use it a lot yeah. in a service where don't as many people come as we thought ought to come. Right. And we comfort ourselves with this verse. Yeah, we when we expected a crowd, but just a few showed up. Yeah. <laughs> and we say, well, Hallelujah. Half of them sick. Some on vacation. I wasn't going to say that. Appreciate that. And we just have a few show up and we comfort ourselves. We say, well, we're going to have church in. Because the Lord said we're two or three. 
are gathered together in his name that he would be and that's accurate a lot of verses however have what we call multiple or twofold meanings well, you could pull many principles out here and I think this verse is one I don't think just that's the only message that Jesus is sending because we use it and, and this is just me so if, if you're if you don't agree with this this is just me but I've always kind of thought growing up that we kind of use this verse it's like well we got two so we met the requirement yeah. he's obligated because he said got to be two. And we met the requirement for two. But boy, if we had three, he'd be here a little bit more powerful. <laughs> and if we had 50, man, it'd been a move of God here. And if we'd had 100, yeah. oh man, then he'll tell them what God would have done. Man. It's like the more we that is here, the more that God would have. So I said, we got two. Well, he's barely here, but he's We had more, we'd have more God. Well, I think there's a bigger message than just than just a numerical value. I think there's a message that what he's focused on is the message of, of, of what you expected and what you got. Or what's represented in your life. He said, it's not always what you want. Your midst is not always what you signed up for. Has anybody ever got anything off the menu of life you didn't order? Something come into your life and you're like, I didn't order that. I didn't want that. But it shows up anyway. In your midst. Plops right down in your life. Makes itself at home. Says, I'm here. What you going to do when stuff like that comes in? didn't expect it. You wanted more and you got less or you wanted less and you got more. What's, what's going to happen, Jesus? So, well, the midst just doesn't have anything to do with whether I'm there. The main thing is, is if you establish my name, he said, I'll be there. It's, I, I know he's talking about numerical value here, but I think the message is bigger. I think the message is our name. What is represented in our midst and what is going on in our midst. He said, that's not the issue. The issue is, if you put my name there, he said, I'll be in your midst. I'm glad tonight to know that if I call upon the name of Jesus, that he will be in my midst. I'm glad that there's nothing that can come in my midst that the Lord will say, well, that's there and I can't come. I think regardless of what's going on in my midst, if I say, Jesus, I need you here, Jesus is going to come and be in my midst. tell you, if it was just if it was just the numerical value thing, we'd have, we'd, we'd have all found ourselves in big trouble. Because truthfully, we always ain't got two. And if two's the requirement, there's there going to be a few times we, we're going to be in big trouble. Because it's just me in a car by myself. And it's just you in a predicament by yourself. You're like, okay, God, i got to find somebody else so you can come. Let me get somebody else here so you can come. Brother, if it had to be two, Daniel would have been up the creek. Because he was thrown in a den of lions. There wasn't no brother there. There wasn't no choir there. There wasn't no sister there. There wasn't no pastor there with him. The saints of God wasn't in the den of lions with him. He was there by himself. The Lord said, well, tough luck. I need to. If you'd have had somebody else, I could have helped you out of that. But that, that's not the issue. The issue is I don't care if your midst is a den alliance. If you call on me, I will be in your midst. I don't care if it's one in a den alliance. I don't care if it's two on the road to Emmaus. I don't care if it's three in a fiery furnace. I don't care if it's four leprous men in the city gate. If you call on me, I don't care what's in the midst. I'll come and I'll be in your midst. I 
place in here in the book of Daniel 3, and I referenced this, but I want to talk about a little more of three Hebrew boys. The Bible said, Daniel 3 and 21. And I'm going to read you the scripture because it's worth reading. The Bible said, Then these men were bound in their coats and hose in their hats, and in their other garments, and the Bible said, and they were cast into, into the what? Into the midst of the burning fire furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace was exceeding hot, the flame and the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fire. You ever felt like your midst was a burning fire? Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselor, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, Lord. And he entered and said, Look, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Yes. What that tells me, I thank you, God, for the Spirit of the Lord I feel here right now. What that tells me is there's some midst that we get into. It should have consumed us. It should have destroyed us. It should have burned us to ashes and to powder. It should have took us out. It should have killed us. It should have destroyed us. But because I wasn't the only one in the midst, Jesus came and Jesus himself joined me in the midst and it gave us the ability to walk through the burning fiery furnace. It gave us the ability to walk through the sickness and to walk through the trial because regardless of what my midst represented, Jesus Christ was in the midst with me and he helped us through. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands up to the Thank you, Jesus. Musicians, if you'd come and help us. God, we magnify and we glorify your marvelous name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Or two or three. Or two or three. Jesus told his disciples, he said, go find a colt. He said, he's tied up in a way where two ways. Sometimes that represents our midst. We get tied up in a place where two ways meet. Where the colt was tied up was a place of the city. Could have went this way, could have went this way, and he was tied up right there. Jesus said, I'm tied. He's in a mist and he don't know what to do, but go loose and bring it to me. If that seems to be your mist, and Lord, I'm just tied up and I don't know what to do, I don't know which way to go, Jesus is here to unloose you and bring you to himself and give you direction for your life. Paul was on a ship in the middle of the storm called Eurachia. And the Bible said, they hadn't seen the sun or moon for days. And they committed themselves to the sea and hoisted the main sail. The Bible said eventually they run the ship aground and the hinder part of the ship broke. And the Bible said they went into a place, the ship ran aground into a place, the Bible said, where two seas meet. Sometimes it's where two or three are gathered. Sometimes it's a place where two waves Sometimes our seed can be, or our midst can be, a place where two seeds. Have you ever had to deal with a problem before? Have you ever had to deal with two problems? Yeah. One stormy sea is enough, right? But this ship ran aground right in the middle of a place where two seeds. Have you ever been there where you got a stormy sea on this hand? And then on this hand, there's another storm we see. They're converging together. God, how am I going to get my midst? It's like 
this stormy sea is affecting this stormy sea, and this stormy sea is affecting this stormy sea, and anything I do over here is going to affect this, and anything I do over here is going to affect this, and my ship is stuck in a place where two seas meet. Is there any way you could join my midst? It doesn't matter what your midst represents. If you call upon the name of Jesus, Jesus will come to your midst. He's not going to look at you and say, I wouldn't touch it. He's not going to look at you and say, I don't want to deal with that. He's going to say, the criteria for me to be in your midst is to call my name. And if you speak my name, I don't care what else is in the midst. If you speak my name, I am going to be in your midst. If it's something you didn't want, call my name. I don't care if it's something that, that you got thrown into, a fiery furnace, call my name and I'll be there. I don't care if it's troubles of life that got you in the middle of it, call my name, he said, and I will be there. If it's a sin that you can't get over, call my name, he said, and I will be in the midst. And if you're here and you want Jesus in the midst, if you call upon him, he'll be in. Revelation chapter 1. John the Revelator <laughs> describes to me one of the greatest descriptions of the glorified Christ that you'll find in the Bible. He was on the isle that was called Patmos. John said, he said, I was there for the kingdom of patience. Jesus Christ he said and I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as it was a sound of a trumpet he said and I turned to see the voice that spake with me he said in being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks now keep reading this you'll find out he meant that the seven golden candlesticks represent him seven churches of Asia. And he said, so if I could just look at it in that light, he said, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, or I saw the seven churches. And he said this in verse 13. He said, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, or rather, in the midst of the seven churches, he said, I saw one like unto the sun, clothed with a garment down the feet heard about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes are the flame of fire. His feet like fine brass, as if they burn in the furnace. His voice has the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And he laid his hand upon me and said, Behold, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore said I saw him the greatest description of the glorified Christ in the Bible he said I saw him in the midst right in the midst of the seven children and if you're going to see God like that well that must have been some churches that had it together that must to see the Lord represented like that to see God in that kind of power and that kind of majesty and that kind of glory that must have been some churches that deserved at these seven churches, brother. What did we say? They got issues. Mm -hmm. One had left their first love. One had teaching doctrine of Nicolaitans. One had the spirit of Jezebel running the church. One, one thought they was doing good and didn't even need anything. Jesus said, what you really need to do is repent. That's right. you, you think you got it together, but you don't. You're miserable. I mean, this was this is churches that had, these were people that had issues, problems in the midst. They had problems. He 
didn't just say, well, in a people of a bunch of problems. Well, he didn't want to be there, but he was there. I saw him. I didn't see him in much power, but he, there, there were two, so it, it qualified him to be there. When people were at their worst, we saw Jesus at his When all kind of things were going on in the midst, that's where John the Revelator said it. But you know how I saw him? I saw you with all the issues and you with all the trouble and you with all the problems. But when I saw him in the midst of you, I saw it. His, his eyes were as a flame of fire. His countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. His feet were like fine grass and that they burned in his furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters. You know, I've seen you at your worst. But when I saw you at your worst, I saw Jesus at his best. I don't know what you're talking I don't know what your mess represents, but I believe he wants to step into your mess with power and dominion hey. and glory and honor and manifest his power in our midst tonight. Can we stand together in this house and lift our hands and our voices and our hearts up to Jesus Christ? I magnify you, Lamb of God. I praise you, Jesus. I exalt you, O oh God. Hallelujah. You want Jesus in your midst? Don't look at what's in your midst and let the devil say, well, here's all the reasons why he's not going to help. Here's all the reasons why he's not going to work. Here's all the reasons why he's not coming. Don't do that, brother, because he don't care what's going on in your midst. You need to look up. You need to look up and say, Lord, sure, I got a lot of stuff going on in the midst, but I want you to be here, and I want you to help me through it, and I want you to help me in it. I'm calling upon the name of Jesus Christ. As they begin to sing here this evening, if you're here, oh, I feel the witness of the Holy Ghost tonight. If you're in this house and you say, hey, Lord, you know what? I want you right in the middle of what's going on in my life. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the solutions. I got issues. I got things I need you to help me with, but I cannot afford to wait. I need you right in the middle of my life. I need you right in the middle of what's going on. If you want God to be in your midst and you want to call on his name, as they begin to sing here this evening, I want somebody to step out of your pew and just come down to this altar and just lift your hands and say, Jesus, I'm calling on your name right now. I need you to help Help me. I need you to lead me. I got two storms brewing on either hand. I'm tied up in a place and I don't know which way to go, God. I need you in my midst. I need you in my midst. Come on, let's see. Say it now. I love you, Lord. I need you, oh God, in my midst tonight.
from the Word of God. What a challenge to us. Blessing from the Lord. If I understand it right,